Well, good morning. Welcome to another episode of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name's James. I work in our education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Welcome, and we're going to learn about adaptations today. Now, you can participate during our program. If you'd like to text us questions while we're live, you can text us at 562-286-1838. Or if you're watching after it's live Monday morning, you can still ask us questions by emailing us at live at lbaop.org. Well, let's get started. I have Kaya on question control, so they'll be helping bring in questions that you have. Talia is going to show us all the magic behind us here. So let's get started with looking at something. Talia, what do we have? <gasps> Ooh, this is a fun exhibit. We got to look at this one a lot during our last class with Kaya. This is our Shark Lagoon habitat. This is a great space to start when we talk about adaptations. But let's first define what that means. Do we all know what adaptation means? We might be able to list some examples of adaptations, but what does it really mean? If you had to describe it to someone, how would you describe that adaptation you might have in mind? Well, we can kind of boil it all down to abilities or behaviors or things that help something survive in their habitat. So what helps an animal or plant or algae or thing survive in a tropical reef habitat like Shark Lagoon? The cool thing is about our sea turtles just hanging out with us. We got to see one of their special adaptations. When it was up at the surface doing something up here we couldn't quite see, it was breathing. Sea turtles are reptiles. They have lungs. They need air in order to breathe. What do they breathe into if they have lungs. They have these little branches that go down to their lungs and all these little spaces that they can absorb oxygen from the air they breathe. Well, what about fish? Are the fish breathing air? No. We usually say they breathe water. They pass the water over their gills and they can absorb the oxygen from the water. So we need to absorb oxygen from air. They need to absorb oxygen from water. Very specific adaptation and it really defines that it you have gills, you tend to live in the ocean. If you have lungs, you tend to live on land, but there's a few crossovers like sea turtles, whales and dolphins. Roly polies actually live on land, but they're crustaceans. Hmm. So you don't have one adaptation that determines everything about where you live, but all your adaptations together are designed to help you survive in your habitat. So what else do we need to live in a space like Shark Lagoon. Let's take a few seconds to think. What else is important to living in a tropical reef habitat like Shark Lagoon? What adaptations do the fish have compared to these coral right here? Hint, the coral's actually not alive. But let's pretend they are. These are replica corals because coral's actually a very sensitive organism. It takes a lot of work to keep coral healthy. And the fish don't mind if we use the replica stuff. So what does this unicorn fish have to survive? We might be drawn to the little horn on their head, but do all unicorn fish have that? Seems like they should with a name like unicorn fish. Turns out they don't. Not all of them have it. And it's not even a male or female thing. There's some species of unicorn fish that have no horn whatsoever. So what are some specific parts of a fish that keeps it alive in its habitat? Well, fins are usually a big observation that people make. Fins. We already mentioned gills. Fins are important. Scales. What about eyes? That fish had some fantastic yellow makeup. But let's look at a Garibaldi, which is a local species here. They have eyes. They're all one color compared to the multiple colors we saw on those tropical reef fish. So that's a nice similarity from a reef animal to a kelp forest animal. Nice, bright, beautiful colors. But now that we're zoomed in on a fish, what other things would you even think of uh, that are important? The easy ones to see on the outside we kind of listed, but what's on the inside that's important too? Well, fish have hearts, intestines, they have a lot of the same parts that we do. They're just different and have a little bit different job in some cases. 
Fish like this also have something called a swim bladder. It's a nice little inflatable device inside their body that they can use to float or to be neutrally buoyant, which means they're not floating or sinking, they're just kind of staying still. So they can help with their up and down movement using their swim bladder. Well, a shark doesn't have that. So even if it lives in the same space, they may have extremely different bodies and adaptations within. This fish has a bony skeleton. Sharks have a cartilage-based skeleton. So what's the difference? Why does that make a difference when it comes to surviving? Well, where do we have bones in our body? You almost can't not point at one because somewhere in, in you are bones. We have vertebra, ribs, our leg bones, our arm bones. We have more bones in our wrists, hands, and feet than we have anywhere else in our body. That helps us walk around and move on land. Are the bones in this fish as large and as dense as ours? Well, if you've eaten any fish, you could probably tell, mm, not quite as much. But let's take a look at some big fish, like in our blue cavern habitat. We'll have Tali see if we can find a spot in our blue cavern feed that shows us the giant sea bass. Giant sea bass are about my size, but they can be a whole lot heavier. They tend to be maybe five to seven feet long at most, but they can get up to 500 or 600 pounds. Big fish. Now they will have a large dense skeleton. Where'd that fish go? Oh, I see a fin. He's swimming over there. This makes them a lot heavier in the same environment than a shark of the equal size. So if a shark were about five to seven feet long, it actually would be much lighter weight because of that cartilage. This gives them a little bit more versatility to move into different spaces. They're also very flexible compared to this giant sea bass. Hey, thank you, shark. Good example right here. Then a shark might have similar colors, the leopard shark, to our giant sea bass. But when you watched it swim, what was that shark doing compared to our giant sea bass? The giant sea bass is moving a little bit of its tail, but not much of its body. Whereas the shark is moving most of its body to help it swim. So a cartilage skeleton in the same habitat, the same conditions, makes it a little bit better at swimming. And the lightweight skeleton means they're not as heavy to move around. It doesn't take as much energy to move as it would for a giant sea bass. Now that can be pretty helpful because sharks often don't eat for days and days at a time. Their diet habits are kind of a feast or famine design where they might eat a lot in a short period of time and then their body actually will process and absorb most of the energy from their food and then they don't have to eat for a while. Now giant sea bass might do that a little bit, but they have a pretty big appetite. They're also ambush predators. So a giant sea bass isn't an active predator. They wait for their food to get too close to them and then they can vacuum it in. It's kind of like if you scoot a box of cookies too close to me, I might just eat too many of them. But if I had to chase them around, oh, I guess I'd have to use it more energy to do that. So it changes their habits if they have different bodies and different abilities. So this is a really good example of two fish with similar color, but very different bodies in the same habitat. But what about sharks in Shark Lagoon versus sharks in Blue Cavern? Do you think they have very similar bodies? Hmm. Well, let's think. We saw a bunch of sharks in Shark Lagoon. How are they the same and different than the ones in Blue Cavern? Well, turns out there's not a lot of differences. So when we're looking at the sharks in here, black tip reef shark coming our way. Very similar body type very similar colors that leopard shark was kind of silver and black and gray and well so was the black tip reef shark okay that must have just been a coincidence let's see if we can find another shark mm, oh, who's in the back there oh we can't see it never mind the sharks are all hiding while i need to talk about them Is that, that's definitely a shark. Showed up. Oh, is that big guy? I think that was big guy. Well, you couldn't quite tell from the video, but big guy is actually kind of brown. Hmm. Well, okay. So now we have a new color. Big guy also is a little bit different shaped shark. Big guy actually is uh, what? 
about 10 feet long, but he's probably no more than 150 to 200 pounds. So even at 10 feet long, big fish, not as heavy as that giant sea bass. So what else have we got swimming around in there? Oh, there was a gray reef shark. So you might notice a lot of sharks have very ooh, zoomed out. That makes it a little bit easier. Thank you. <laughs> the color of a lot of sharks is very similar where there's dark on the back and light on the belly. And a lot of the dark colors on top are silvers and grays, maybe browns. Really depends on the animal or where they need to hide. So even if you go back to a kelp forest habitat, we don't need to right now. But even if we go back to a kelp forest habitat, things like horn sharks, they have kind of a brown and tan and black speckled design on their body. So coloring, regardless of where you're at, helps you hide either from your predators or from your prey. So you have to think about color as an adaptation too. Color often helps you either stand out like that Garibaldi or helps you blend in because the color pattern breaks up your outline so things can't see you very easily. Let's go back to the picture of the Garibaldi while we're talking about color as an adaptation. So this animal would live in some place like Blue Cavern. What kind of colors did we see in Blue Cavern? While we're thinking, we had a couple questions come in. So think back to Blue Cavern. What does Blue Cavern look like? All right, Anthony was asking, what do giant sea bass like to eat? Well, not that fish. This fish probably would not get eaten by a giant sea bass. But it could. It just depends on the giant sea bass, I guess. Giant sea bass, we said, are ambush predators, meaning they'll vacuum in. They just suck it in real quick. Pretty much any fish that might get too close to them. They probably won't feed from the sea floor because if you look at their face, their mouth kind of points forward or up. So they are going to be feeding on things in front of them or just above them, not things below them. So think of animals that might be swimming or moving around in the water, not animals that are crawling around on the ground. And Anthony, pretty much anything like we said that gets too close might get vacuumed in. Now, our biggest animal at the Aquarium of the Pacific, besides the sharks, well, it depends on how you want to define big. So before we take a look at it, let's see. We'll have Talia get ready to bring up Shark Lagoon again real quick. But the, remember, the giant sea bass and the Garibaldi live in the same space, but are very different colors. The giant, the giant sea bass likes to blend in, whereas the Garibaldi, even though this is not life-size, the Garibaldi is about that big, it will chase around a giant sea bass. That color pattern on their body being so bright in such a darker and more dull pattern of exhibit space is warning color. It means I got a big attitude and I'm more dangerous than you, so swim away. That's what Garibaldi like to do. They're very sassy fish. They're very territorial protective fish. They want to protect their own little nest and burrow. So even though they're colored like a coral reef habitat, their color in a kelp forest habitat is more about warning coloration. Well, to answer the question of who's the biggest in the aquarium, there's one of two possibilities. One is this fish way over here. She's kind of moving. Nope, that's fish around her moving. Never mind. So this is our reticulated whiptail ray. Our whip ray is at last weigh-in, which I think was a decade ago, about 400 pounds. She's actually big enough we can't really weigh her anymore. It's not really easy to get her out without really stressing her out. So... We just let her go. We know she's a healthy size because that's a normal size for the whip rays. She's about six feet wide and over 10 feet long. So she's the biggest fish that we have in terms of weight and just about overall length. But the next biggest animal by biggest is Parker the sea lion. Parker's a pretty big guy. When Parker's at his maximum weight, this guy in the back, when Parker's at his maximum weight just before summer hits in the early summer, he's been over 800 pounds, which is pretty normal for a California sea lion. Some California sea lions might get up to about eight to 900, depends on if you're a really big boy, but most of the time they're not surpassing 1,000 pounds. You need to be a stellar sea lion to be over 1,000 pounds, which we don't have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, but we do have them living in Southern California. So Parker's probably our next biggest thing at the aquarium in terms of overall size. Now, Parker is probably about the same length, about 10 feet long as our whip ray, but he's a lot bigger. He's got blubber. He's much more round and rotund. 
and he has heavy bones. That stingray has a cartilage skeleton like a shark. But uh, Parker has bones in their body, which makes them heavier because bones are much denser than cartilage. Now, Ethan's asking, where in the ocean do sea bass live? Well, Ethan, if you live here in Southern California, they're in our ocean backyard. They live around Southern California, Central California. They're in a kelp forest habitat. There's actually quite a few of them that can be seen at the Real Blue Cavern dive site off of Catalina, which is in a marine protected area. It's kind of like an underwater national park. So if you were ever had a chance to go snorkeling or diving around Catalina or actually any of the barrier islands, you probably would see a giant sea bass if you waited and looked long enough. Because remember, their color is great for hiding in plain sight. Now someone asked, how deep in the ocean would they live? You know, that's a good question. It gets tougher to find them over 100 feet deep because it gets kind of dark down there. But they've been seen in the real blue cavern, which can be over 100 feet deep. Now remember, they're going to want to hide in the kelp. Kelp usually is not as densely populated where it's over 100 feet deep because kelp gets energy from the sun. So kelp, just like a plant, uses photosynthesis. But they can only do photosynthesis if there's enough light. If the intensity of light is too low, they aren't really going to do very well. So giant kelp like this one might not grow more than 100 feet in the ocean. Because once that little planktonic larva lands, it has to grow into this. If there's not enough light, not enough light when it lands in that one spot at two or 250 feet of depth, it's just not going to survive. So... If you're an algal plankton larva, you're going to want to land somewhere bright, like these did. So that's a great question. How deep can we find them? They might go deeper than the kelp, but the kelp forest is their home. So they're probably going to stick closer to the kelp forest. Now, an interesting question popped in about why do fish have fins on their heads? It's not just fashionable. It's important for swimming. It depends on the fish, though. Not all fish have that fin right at the front of their head. Now, Blue Cavern has a few different fish in here that give us a different idea of what fish should look like. We have a very stereotypical or classic-looking fish, like this one here, the giant sea bass. But we also have eels in here. So eels hide. This green moray eel doesn't technically have a fin. This isn't fin. This is fleshy. This is thick. It's just got skin and just a like ridge on their back. So fins are great for swimming, not only for pushing you around the water, but for steering and for keeping you upright. Think of how an airplane is designed. The tail of the airplane has a vertical section to it, right? That helps keep the plane from tipping too much. Works the same way with fish. So when fish have a fin on their back, called a dorsal fin, it keeps them from rolling too much when they're moving around. So different fish swim differently. Sharks push with their tail. This dorsal fin helps keep it upright. The pelvic and anal fins help keep it upright too. But the pectoral fins are for steering. Now other fish in the ocean, bony fish, will swim in a different way. It depends on the kind of bony fish. Some bony fish, like the giant sea bass, push with their tail, just like a shark does, and they steer with the sides. But in other cases, like a wrasse, all wrasses, that's W-R-A-S-S-E, all of the wrasses push with these and steer with their tail. So the side fins are good for moving around, but wrasses, like the sheephead wrasse, are pushing with their pectoral fins and steering with their tail. Now, if they needed to sprint... They might swing this real big tail a few times to get going into a burst of speed, but generally they're moving around by pushing with the sides. All right, Mrs. Ruiz's class are, is asking, are giant sea bass aggressive towards humans? Nope. Not even a little bit. You want to see what giant sea bass do when there's a camera in front of them? Let's see if we can go back. this. That's it. 
What if there's a person in front of them? That's, this is it. This is all they do. Turns out, giant sea bass are so curious and friendly that when people were allowed to spearfish them, they wouldn't even realize what's going on. It took a while before they adapted to avoid spearfishers. But initially, they were just like, well, what are you doing? That's a weird thing. And then they would be easily fished out of the ocean. So a lot of divers would actually report that they're swimming around, they're hanging out in the kelp forest, they just stop and look around, and suddenly there's a giant sea bass in the distance. And then the giant sea bass comes closer and closer and just almost gets up in their face and just stares at them. So while they're a big fish, look like they should be kings of their space, they're actually very docile fish. They don't do a whole lot to other things that unless they want to eat it. We're not food, so they're not going to do anything to us. The only time that they would actually really interact with the divers in this exhibit is during feeding time because the divers have to get in to feed them. So not aggressive. They're actually extremely friendly fish. But whenever you're out in the ocean, you kind of want nature to be nature. Let it be. Avoid them if you can so that we don't interact with them in a way that might be the wrong way. So if you ever get a chance to go swimming or snorkeling or diving and you see them, just kind of hang out, let them do their thing. And if they come say hello, you can say hello, but we don't want to try and interact with them too much. Now, another cool question came in is, how do the sea bass protect themselves? Well, at this point, it's just by sheer size. So size is an important adaptation too. Size is really important when it comes to avoiding certain predators. What are some really big animals in the ocean that you can think of? Maybe giant octopus or giant squid. What are some of the biggest things in the ocean? Whales. Whales are large, large animals. The humpback whale is about 50 to 55 feet and 100,000 pounds. And they might venture into kelp forest spaces or open ocean spaces near where big fish is. So a big fish or a big whale, size is kind of your protection. But when they're babies, that's where the danger is. Now, giant sea bass start very tiny, little tiny itty bitty baby fish. Whales don't start that small, but even at their smallest, they're still vulnerable to predation. Orca are often predators of small whales, but some sharks might feed on them too. But in general, because whales are so big overall, even when they start out in life, for the most part, there's not much that's going to eat them. But if you start out as a little tiny fish, it's a lot easier to eat you. Now this little fish, this is Utaka. Utaka is now about four years old and maybe about that big. Let me get all of me on screen. I think it's about that big. But when it started out, it was like this much, very tiny. So even though a giant sea bass is a large fish, and at its largest size, most of the time there's not many predators that want to interact with it. When they're smaller, they're more susceptible to predation. But remember, if you start out real big, a baby whale, see a baby humpback is probably 15 feet long. You start out big enough, it's tough for predators much smaller than you to try and hunt you. So size is an incredibly important adaptation. What if you're all very small? and you don't get very big at all. What can you do to protect yourself? Hmm. While you think of that, Emma has a question of, how long do humpback whales live? Good question, Emma. It's kind of tough to estimate while we see them. We have to actually test after they've passed away, unless you've recorded when they were born and know when they died. We can test whale age by looking at their earwax. Yep, it's kind of gross, but really cool. You can test their earwax to figure out how old they were when they passed away. But the humpback whale can live over 50 years. A lot of whales have almost human lifespans. There's a couple species that can live over 70 to 90 years. And then there's one that we know of that can live 200 years. That's the bowhead whale. So whales can have pretty long lifespans. Most dolphin species are a little bit shorter, maybe 40 to 50, but humpbacks should be able to get 250 or more years. This kind of depends on the individual, the conditions they're in, and now that there's no whaling, a lot more opportunity for them to live a lot longer. All right, do you remember what we need to do if we were all small 
to protect ourselves. How would we do that? Hmm. Well, if we all had armor, that would help out, like snails. I don't usually see snails clumping together that much, though. What if you're all a bunch of fish, and you're all this big? You would school together. So schooling behaviors help a lot of small things stay alive. It's that safety numbers plan. So schooling fish will usually hang out in large thousands and thousands of individual groups. They bundle together. They all swim in the same direction. And that's one way to protect themselves. If it's harder to find one individual in the group, chances are it's harder for the predators to be able to hunt. But if you also move like one weird blob in the ocean, it's not as easy for predators to get to you. But a few predators have figured, figured it out. Sharks and dolphins and large whales have definitely figured out how to collect and hunt individuals from a school of fish. Now, schooling is when they all swim in the same approximate direction and they hang out together. Shoaling is when they all just kind of hang out in the same space, but do whatever they want. They might all migrate to a different area, but they don't all swim in the same direction at the same time. So schooling or shoaling are helpful for when you're not very big. So here's a shoal. You can see all these yellow fish are kind of hanging out in the same direction, but not really. These silvery fish, these fusiliers, are doing a little more schooling than shoaling. So Clumping together in large groups is really helpful if you're not a big animal. Now, Queenie asked an interesting question. Can giant sea bass take out their predators? Um, since they're usually docile, it's not like they're going to counterattack a predator. They might do things to protect themselves, which would harm a predator. But remember, until they're very big, they're not able to do a whole lot besides hide. So once they're this size, the predators don't even really bother with them 99% of the time, I would say. But I would, I would imagine they can protect themselves, but probably not reverse this situation and eat their predator. So they're not going to play a reverse card on that situation. They're just too big for other predators to think it's important or easy enough to try and hunt one. So predation is a very interesting adaptation too. Behaviors in predation, how you protect yourself from predators, those are all really interesting adaptations. And remember, some of them are learned behaviors. It's not just an innate ability like scales or shells or claws or venomous spines. Sometimes you just learned how to avoid your predator or learned how to prey on something else. So some animals learn from their parents how to prey on things. Not fish. Fish are usually not cared for for very long after hatching. But mammals are often taught through what is called a matron line, mom teaches the babies how to hunt things. So if mom knows how to do it, the babies are going to learn how to do it. And so there's this continuous pattern of knowledge for mammals to learn how to hunt. They might learn something new in their lifetime, but they start out learning how to hunt from mom, like a sea otter does. Sea otters can eat a wide array of things like crabs and sea stars and abalone and urchins clams they have a varied diet which is really good for being able to survive if there's something that's missing from that habitat but they're not going to know how to hunt all of it unless mom taught them how to hunt all of it so that's something to remember some animals have preferential feeding because that's what they learned how to do so we want to protect a habitat to allow all of the things in that habitat to survive so that the adaptations of something like a sea otter giant sea bass, a whale, are adapted to the conditions we know should be there versus the new conditions that may arise. So adaptation is a slow process. So adapt adaptations are things that we have to survive. The process of adapting can take generations of time. So we need to be concerned with how fast are the conditions changing and can those things in that habitat, that space they call home, keep up with the changes. Now, Miss Mitchell's third grade class is asking, when fish grow, do their scales shed or does their skin stretch like ours? Ooh, well, even ours doesn't technically stretch. Unless you grew too fast, too big, too much, then you might stretch the skin. But so let's say your size at third grade, you would replace all of the skin within a few years. 
So you haven't stretched your skin to get bigger. It's not like stretching out your t-shirt because it was in the dryer too long. That's not how growing works. You grow more skin. So even we have similarities to them. They shed scales pretty frequently and they just grow more skin as they get bigger. And then they can grow more scales. And in fact, their scales get bigger too. So big fish like this, their scales are increasing in size as they grow up. Sharks grow more skin. It's not like they stretched it out. They grew more skins and they grew more scales on top of their skin. So very interesting question, Mrs. Mitchell's third grade class. Very cool way to end our program. I hope I answered it to a completion that you are satisfied with. Remember, if any of your questions have not been answered, you can still email us at live at lbaop.org and we can help answer them for you about adaptations or about any of our programs you might have been seeing. So check us out on our YouTube channel or our website where we'd have more Aquarium Online Academy coming up this Wednesday. Or feel free to watch any program that we have in our library that we've done since last year. Thank you and join us on Wednesday for more adaptation fun.